Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 14th meeting in 2015? Can I ask everyone please to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when switched to silent? And apologies have been received from Alison McInnes. Item 1. The Committee is invited to agree to consider our work programme under Item 5 in private. Are you agreed? Thank you very much. <laughs> item 2. Inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden deaths. Scotland Bill. This is our main item of business today, and it's our first evidence session on this inquiry into fatal accidents and sudden deaths. And we'll hear from two panels of witnesses in the bill today. And I, first panel, I welcome Lord Cullen of Whitekirk to the meeting. Lord Cullen conducted a review of fatal accident inquiry legislation in 2008-2009, and the bill would implement many, but not all, of the recommendations uh, from his review. Lord Cullen, do you wish to make any opening statement or go straight to questions? But just a, a very few remarks. Okay. Um, my remit was to review the operation of the 1976 Act so as to ensure, and I quote, an effective and practical system of public inquiry into deaths which is fit for the 21st century. As I started my work, it became clear that I was concerned not merely with legislation in whatever form, but also the way in which the legislation is operated by organisations such as the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service. The discussion in my report and the recommendations that I have made, I suppose, are concerned with three general strands. One is to update the system, secondly, to expand the system in certain respects, and thirdly, to improve the system so far as one could through my report. As you said, my report was uh, published in October 2009, and since then there have been a number of responses by the Scottish Government but I'm here to answer your questions and help you in any way I can. Thank you very much. And I move straight to questions from members, please. I've got John Finney, Elaine Murray, Margaret Mitchell, Roddy Campbell. So far, John. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Lord Cullen. Uh, Lord Cullen, your review recommended that the death any ch of any child looked after in a, a residential establishment should trigger a mandatory FAI. Can you explain the rationale behind that recommendation, please? Well... It was this, that um, where a child is put into the care of others, and I'm not talking about away from the family, there is a responsibility of care and protection owed to that child. And I felt that that was appropriate to be consideration for being covered by a fatal accident inquiry. I appreciate we're not talking about compulsory measures because those are accepted by the government and now form part of the bill. But the idea was simply that they are in the protection of others, and if something happens during the course of that uh, time being protected, it is right and proper there should be a, an FAI. I appreciate what has been said by the government, that it does open up quite a wide range of possible situations, but I've said what I can say in my report, and I can't really add to that. I mean, cle clearly the issue of... Uh terminology is terribly important and that would include boarding schools. Now there's no reason why given the def definition you said originally about being in the care of others that would still apply to boarding schools. It, it certainly would and uh, I appreciate that of <coughs> course but that is a matter perhaps of drafting if the principle is accepted then appropriate drafting could confine it to what are thought to be the areas of concern. But that wouldn't necessarily exclude boarding schools would be my point. Oh yes, mm -hmm. I accept yeah. that. Yeah. I wonder, Lord Cullen, can I touch on, a, on another point, and it is the issue of um, public interest. Um, to what extent should public interest determine whether the Lord Advocate should hold a fatal accident inquiry? Well, from the beginning, the conception has been that a fatal accident inquiry should be held in the public interest for the information of the public uh, and, of course, for action if necessary. Uh, but, of course, that from the beginning also involves the need to provide for the participation of those, those who have been directly affected by what happened. Uh, so the initiative essentially lies with the uh, public authority, namely the Lord Advocate, except in such cases where Parliament has decided that there must be one, a mandatory one, uh, obviously subject to the proviso about criminal uh, um, in prosecution or an inquiry under the Inquiries Act, which might make that unnecessary. But the essential idea is it's held in the public interest, and everything must be responsive to that. Uh, and you're relaxed about there being a measure of discretion afforded the Lord Advocate with that decision-making? 
Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that discretion has always been exercised responsibly. Uh, I think it's quite important that the public and the individuals concerned should know why it has been exercised against one. That's why I recommended that reasons should be given. Uh, and should that power of discretion be challengeable? Well, I suppose technically it could be challenged through the judicial review. That is technically possible. But then, of course, there would have to be some legal flaw underlying uh, the matter. And, of course, reasons are given. Those reasons of themselves might open up the way to judicial review. Th th that would t tend to suggest that the, the system is one of disclosure, complete disclosure. And that's not always the case with deaths giving rise to public concern? Well, I'm not sure if I can agree with your general statement that uh, there's lack of disclosure. Um, all I'm saying is that if reasons are given, they m might open up the need for judicial review. Of course, it wouldn't lead to a situation in which the court could say that there must be an inquiry. It would simply mean if the challenge was successful, the Lord Advocate would have to think again. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Lord Cullen. Uh, Elaine Murray, please, Elaine. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, convener. Um, Lord Cullen, um, there's been some debate around whether or not uh, fatal accident inquiries should be, there should be a time limit for uh, bringing forward an FAI. Uh, some of the arguments against that have been that any criminal proceedings should have to take place first. In your view, would it be permissible, would it be acceptable for an FAI to take place before criminal proceedings have taken place? Before? Before any criminal proceedings have taken place or, or while criminal th investigation, criminal proceedings were underway? I think the general answer to that is uh, it would not be wise for them to start before the conclusion mm -hmm. of criminal proceedings. I appreciate that uh, proposals have been made by, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ms Ferguson yeah. for uh, time limits and they include the possibility of an FAI opening only to be adjourned. Mm. Uh, the, the, the problem I've got with the latter idea is that uh, how much could usefully be achieved during that first initial phase? Because even perhaps an explanation of how the deceased came to die might mm. be relevant to the criminal prosecution. There's always a danger that whatever is mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. uh, creates a, a problem uh, for the criminal prosecution if it is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. So my answer would be better to have the criminal proceedings finished. Thanks for that. I uh, can also ask you about the issue of Sheriff's recommendations. Before, because before you proceed, sorry, Elaine, um, one of your proposals, Lord Cullen, is to hold an initial court hearing mm -hmm. soon after death is reported. What would that be if it was simply to have that and then adjourn, which you've well, already thank, said? Thank you for raising that point, because what I put forward there was the proposal, not that we embark on the FAI itself, but merely have a meeting for the information mm. of the relatives and interested parties to inform them as to the progress of uh, investigation and proceedings, if necessary, criminal proceedings. Now, that is something quite new. Mm. It would be, the idea would be to enable them to know what's going on, and I thought it would be useful to have an independent person in the position of the sheriff able to say, can you give me an explanation as to what's going on here? So there were no evidence to be heard. It would not technically be the beginning of the FAI. It would be an application. Perhaps I could describe it as an application for a potential FAI, because it might not, of course, go ahead if there were criminal proceedings and it was found after that there was no point in having one. So therefore, the matter would simply be discontinued. It's simply in order to enable the families and other persons who are directly involved to know what's going on and that be satisfied that steps are being taken, all proper steps are being taken to progress matters. So it, if I may say it would be procedural rather than substantive, what Absolutely. might prejudice mm. a, 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 any subsequent yes. criminal proceedings. But do you appreciate that uh, this particular idea of mine has not found favour, I think, with the Scottish yeah. Government? I don't think that matters to the Committee, really. <laughs> <laughs> not always. Uh, <laughs> but it's an interesting proposal, yeah. and I thought perhaps it you know, would help with yes. what you're yes, 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the other issue I was wanting to ask you, where there seems to be a difference of opinion between yourself and the government, Scottish Government and Ms Ferguson, was an issue of Sheriff's recommendations, because you recommended that um, there should be an obligation to respond to Sheriff's uh, recommendations. Uh, I think um, 
Patricia Ferguson suggests it should be a legal requirement to comply with a sheriff's recommendation, although there would be the opportunity to explain why you hadn't done so. But the government has not taken forward your suggestion that um, information be published on recommendations and responses in the report to Parliament. Um, what's your well, current you've situation? Covered a number of, of topics there. Yeah. The, the first one is to do with publication. Mm. Uh, I was anxious that everything should be done to enable. Um, the sheriff's recommendations to be brought home in the sense mm. of being made known to the public and to p p positions in some position of authority so they could take what action was required. Hence, my recommendations about dissemination mm. and, on the other hand, my recommendations that um, there should be a publication of the sheriff's determinations and the response. Now, uh, f from my point of view, I wondered how could I make sure that these determinations and the responses to them, or lack of response, got as high a profile as possible. And that's why I recommended that it sh they should be tendered to the government, so that uh, the both parliaments, Scottish Parliament and UK Parliament, could be aware of what was happening and what the responses mm -hmm. were, and uh, take any action that was appropriate. But uh, that particular proposal about being published and the subject of an annual report did not find favour with the Scottish Government and instead they have left the matter in the hands mm -hmm. of the, tribunals, the courts and tribunal service. But I still would like, if possible, mm -hmm. to be as high a profile as possible given to the recommendations. I don't want it ever to be thought that these determinations and recommendations are overlooked. Mm. Some of the written evidence people, some witnesses in written evidence have said they didn't think that the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service was the appropriate organization to report well uh, when i wrote my report i hope i'm correct in saying this i think at that time the court and tribunal service did uh, have our website setting out sheriff's determinations mm. and their recommendations mm. there was of course nowhere at that stage uh, which set out what the responses might be that was yet to come so the question is where should the responses go <coughs> and that's why i mm. thought it was better to go for the scottish government than to the court uh, service. They could, of course, go to both, with links between the two of them, of course. But the point is, matter of profile, and that's why I thought the Scottish Government should be the best uh, uh, person to go. I mentioned the UK Parliament as well, because some of the potential recommendations of a sheriff could apply to reserve matters, which, of course, is a matter for the UK Parliament, such as health and safety. Now, you also touched on the question of uh, how the recommendations are dealt with. Um, I have read the proposals um, by Ms Ferguson for the, what you might call the enforcement of Sheriff's uh, recommendations. And um, I have some thoughts on the matter. Um, my first thought is this. If um, a, a party to uh, an FAI thought that uh, it was likely to be the subject of a legal duty to comply with a sheriff's recommendation, it would want to have the clearest specification during the inquiry as to what that was to be, an opportunity to contest it, if necessary, with evidence. Uh, the position in regard to a non-participant in the inquiry would be even more uh, significant because that uh, non-participant wouldn't hear until after the FAI what was the sheriff's order? And it would require, to, in fairness again, to be given the opportunity to uh, contest that, presumably by some form of hearing of evidence, mm -hmm. after the FAI had finished. Now, what concerns me about the whole of that is that it runs counter to the, to the idea that an FAI is there for the purposes of inquisition, not in order mm -hmm. to establish rights and duties and obligations. That's quite foreign to the FAI, and I think it would be inappropriate. It would involve, apart from anything else, a considerable increase in the amount of time spent in the Sheriff Court dealing with these matters, which are really matters to be followed up by organisations that have an interest in the matter, such as the Health and Safety Executive or, indeed, one or other of the parliaments. That's my first comment. The second comment is this, that if the Sheriff's recommendations are to become mandatory, then that places the sheriff in the position of being able to, um, if you like, enact a legal duty. Now, of course, apart from the fact that's foreign to the FAI, 
it places the sheriff in a rather strange position because enacting of legal duties is really a matter for the parliament. Mm -hmm. And if the sheriff enacts a duty which is to be complied with and necessarily enforced by punishment or a fine, if that's to happen, then the question is what do you do with that duty if it turns out that it was uh, not a wise recommendation or it's become superseded or some, some other reason for thinking it's not good, how do you get rid of it? You would, I suppose, have to enact uh, a, a, by legislation in order to get rid of it. Because until that point of time, the party concerned would have to comply with that legal duty. Now, I think that's a, a point which shading into uh, a constitutional issue as to who's in charge. And it seems to me that's really a matter for Parliament. And the third point I'd make was a purely practical one is that some recommendations made by sheriffs simply are not the sort of thing which you would want to be made the subject of a legal duty such as um, um, a recommendation to consider something or discuss something or collaborate. Uh, some other recommendations might be misguided, they might be superseded, they might conflict with what was being done or recommended somewhere else in Scotland. So to sort all that out it would be far better to leave it to potential legislation or the action taken by some authority which has got charged with the responsibility for looking after safety. So I'm sorry to be so long in my answer, but these are the three points that I felt when I'd thought about the matter. Thanks very much. Thanks. Would there not also be a question of um, ECHR involved if some duty was being imposed um, after a recommendation and it became binding and a party had not been party to the proceedings well, and well, that, have the right to fair hearing. Indeed, indeed that, because that comes back to the point I mentioned, mentioned earlier. If, uh, uh, if you don't participate in the inquiry, you suddenly find yeah. that a sheriff has imposed a duty on you, you have to start all over again by yeah. saying, well, what's the case for it or against it? Thank you very much. Margaret? Good morning, Lord Colonel. It, it seems to me that if um, the bill is to be affected, there are certain resource implications which have to be taken account of. For example, in your recommendations, you um, suggest that the reasonable test for legal representation for relatives could be with, withdrawn. Um, and I, I think the idea behind that was that while the Crown and Procurator Fiscal um, could ask some questions on behalf of relatives, then they represent the public interest. The Scottish Government's rejected this, saying in this financial climate it isn't the right time, but it seems there are access to justice questions here. Well, that's part of their answer, and I, I quite appreciate that. Um, what uh, led me in this direction, as you will have seen from the report, was the um, reflection that um, the families have a distinct point of view. Um, which not merely shows that they have a, a standing, as it were, to ask questions, but um, reasonable grounds themselves for, 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 for asking what uh, should have been done or could have been done. Now, um, I appreciate what's been said, that the Procurator Fiscal is there and can take account of what they say, but he's not bound to do so. He's not conducting his position, his part of the inquiry, on behalf of them. So they have a distinct interest, and it, that led me to think, well, why shouldn't they get um, access to legal, legal aid? Subject, of course, to the limits of what's financial available to them. Why shouldn't they have it? Then there was a reasonable, reasonableness of their participation should not be in question. So if um, we're talking about updating and improving, then it seems um, to me that this is a key access to justice question. Well, it can be treated as such. But then, of course, it's not access to justice in the normal sense, because access to justice is normally referred to in the question of access to justice in a court of law. This is not a court of law. Yeah. But the question is whether there is a public interest, so to speak, in the families having that degree of support. Yeah. Can I also ask you about the resourcing of the Crown and Procurator uh, Fiscal Service? Because we've seen delays of up to four years before even um, a fatal accident inquiry has been thought of. And you had very specific recommendations about resourcing mm -hmm. and creating a central team with Crown and, uh, the Crown and Procurator Fiscal coordinating and yes. monitoring. Yes. Yes, the, these delays have been um, very dismaying and uh, very, very unfortunate. 
as you say, I made a number of recommendations to try to um, um, reinforce the need that the COPFS should put resources into the adequate priority being given to FAIs. Now, you will no doubt hear from them as to what they have succeeded in doing. There's one respect in which what has happened is not in accordance with what I suggested. I suggested a team which would be devoted specifically to FAIs, whereas it has turned out to be part of a larger death unit approach to matters. And that may be perfectly all right. I don't know. I've heard a lot of reassuring statements made by the COPFS, and I trust it's been working well, but you'll no doubt be able to hear from them and judge uh, whether that has been successful so far. Mm -hmm. Well, there does seem to be a bit of a precedent, certainly in, in criminal matters, where we've got the domestic abuse task force within the COPFS mm -hmm. to, to, to make sure that that's dealt with as yes. efficiently as possible. So it seems to me there's a, a, a relationship between the As two. I said when I was opening, the, the working of this system is dependent upon the working together of the legislation on the one hand and the COPFS and, on the other and the two have got to work, to, uh, ad work together well enough to make sure there are no unavoidable delays. And would this uh, extra resource, in, in your opinion, just going back to what Elaine Murray brought up uh, about this early, um, this early hearing, which would um, give some information and well, communication? That, that is an important connection, because uh -huh. that's the context in which I think I talked about this, all to do with delay. If the COPFS have made such uh, improvements that um, fears about the family not being kept in the, full, fully in the picture are groundless, then that makes the case for an early hearing of the type I described earlier unnecessary. The two work together. Mm -hmm. And it, my, uh, the idea I had in mind was to have this very early hearing uh, just to make sure, that, and that was a spur to effort, and disclosure. But if the COPF system is working well, that makes the case for that early hearing less good. Two go, go together. So at present, we're, we don't have the commitment to the early hearing in the bill, and we don't seem, it's not clear if the Crown Procurator Fiscal has received the additional funding which would help to improve yeah. its... I mean, I appreciate there is a problem about the early hearing, because when is it to be? Mm -hmm and the government have said various things at different stages as to when it should be, tending to say oh, it would only, only be held when uh, you know enough to know that the FAI is going to be going ahead. But um, what I had in mind was something rather earlier than that, but getting a time for this is very difficult. Mm -hmm. What do you relate it to? You, you've got, considering the whole range of FAIs that may cover a diversity of situations, diversity of accidents, very difficult. And does it just involve the Crown Procurator Fiscal, or does it involve Police Scotland as well? Well, they would presumably feature in this um, as part of the work being done for the COPFS. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't have a separate position, but they would simply be part of what's being done to investigate. Yeah, thank you. Roddy. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, morning, Lord Cullen. If I may, I'd like to m move to the question of kind of um, the compulsory detention of people for mental health issues. Um, you recommended this would be suitable for uh, a mandatory FAI. Um, that uh, recommendation is not being taken forward. Indeed, the government has consulted um, on alternatives. Uh, we know that uh, despite those alternatives that uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, indeed the Scottish Human Rights Commission, seem to have reservations. Um, I don't know if you've had the opportunity of looking at what the government have said in their um, policy memorandum in relation to the position <coughs> in relation to those detained for mental health reasons uh, and where the government makes reference to uh, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists graduated scale of investigations. But in the light of what's happened since you initially reported, uh, um, how do you feel about the government's proposals at the current time? You mean, how do I feel about the fact that they're not incorporating this in the Act? <laughs> um, well, at the time, and I think still, I felt that there was a clear read across between persons who were in the custodial situation 
uh, through criminal behavior, and on the other hand, those who were in mental health hospitals by way of compulsion. Um, each of those groups of people are there by compulsion. Um, they're also in, in they're being protected, as it were, by the authority into whose care they have been committed. And the Human Rights Act does not, I think, draw a distinction between the two, because cases are, are certainly have cropped up where deaths have occurred in uh, mental hospitals, where people have been held there compulsively, are being held, have been held to be covered by the Human Rights Act, Article 2, I think it is, in the same way as those who are in prison or other form of custody. So that is why I thought they should be treated in the same way. Now, of course, I appreciate it can be said that a person who dies in a mental hospital may die of natural causes, but then the same may be said of those who die in, in prison. And so most of the things that apply in one would apply to the other. So at the moment, um, I feel there's still something to be said for this. Nothing that's happened since then has uh, changed my mind. I've read, of course, what's in the policy memorandum. It shows a number of possible avenues, but no mandatory avenue. And that's what I had in mind. So you still remain of the view that a mandatory approach is the correct? I, I still consider that there's a lot to be said for it. Notwithstanding the reservations of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the mental Well, of course. You, you, yeah. This committee has got to balance everything up, and that's the point of view. Um, it's balancing one thing against another. OK. Um, in more general terms, in your report, you pointed out that uh, in 1998, 19 Nine, there were 141 fatal accident inquiries, whereas in 2008 and 9, at the time of your report, there were 57. Um, last financial year, I think there were 59. In the previous year, there were 33 uh, fatal accident inquiries. In general terms, do you think, uh, as a society, we've got it right? Fatal accident inquiries being quite an expensive procedure. Um, what's your general view on the number of fatal accident inquiries? I've heard nothing at any stage to suggest that we have uh, too few or too many. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Um, yeah, OK. Um, perhaps, perhaps I'll leave that particular one in the end. Perhaps, perhaps you, we could, what, what, what would you draw by comparing the system we have in Scotland from the system south of the border? I would hesitate to draw comparisons. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, I have looked at their system for certain limited purposes, but, but not for an overall view. No. Thank you, Lord Cullen. I'm looking at the um, distinction which you make about an early an inquiry, an early inquiry mm -hmm. <coughs> before an FAI and preliminary hearings. Um, what's, why is the preliminary hearing not good enough um, and you wish something else in advance of preliminary hearing? Well, a preliminary hearing is there in order to organise the management of the FAI. In other words, you have embarked. Okay. So you want to make sure the time is properly spent, that you've got proper arrangements for what's to come in the future, so you're, you're, on, you're on the way. What I mentioned discussing earlier about an early hearing was simply and solely for the purposes of information being given before the sheriff, information for the benefit of the families and other interested persons. That's all. Why, why does it have to be done before a sheriff and not something that the Crown Office should be doing anyway um, in a more well, informal fashion, well, just keeping those interested parties... Well, that, Madam Chairman, is that indeed, Madam Chairman, that is the question. Because I thought it would be better to have an independent person could say, look, um, I want to make sure you tell me effectively in front of everybody what the position is, what is happening. That's all. Yes, I think, I think uh, I'm quite persuaded by that because it seems that quite often, as it's in the public interest, grieving relatives and friends are unaware of their, or are mixed messages about their role, if any, in an FAI, and it's quite hard for them to appreciate their position with regard to it. So you think uh, this, this earlier um, well, I don't hearing want, would be helpful? Yes. I don't want to down, downplay the, what the CEO. PFS has been doing and will be doing, not at all. 
but I think it would be useful to have the addition okay. of appearance before the sheriff. And if necessary, it could be held in chambers. It doesn't have to be held in public. I see. It could be in chambers. Not in open court. It could be in chambers. Yes. I don't see why not. That's interesting. I've got Christian, then I've got it. Christian. Hey, good morning, Lord Cullen. Uh, I just wanted to press you on one particular point. Uh, we had one of uh, uh, a member's bill uh, wanted to, to be introduced on, uh, and wanted to add uh, to cover all the work related deaths uh, in, the, uh, in the categories of uh, monetary uh, FAR. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about it? Do you think it should be, we should have, it should be a human right to have it included? Are you talking about the um, suggestion, I think, in the Ferguson bill yes. to cover other work-related deaths than the ones currently covered? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, think, I think there are problems about this. Um, if we take a typical example of uh, industrial disease, um, by the time, perhaps long before the death occurs, it will be known what the person concerned is suffering from and what kind of exposure caused that disease. So the question is what public interest would be served by holding a public inquiry in order to establish either the cause of death or the kind of exposure that caused it. If it's then a question of, well, where did he acquire this exposure, there will be um, uh, an employment history. Now, how much can the public interest be served by inquiring into the way in which that particular industry conducted itself? It could be years and years ago. It could be at a stage of time when there were old-fashioned practices which are no longer um, being followed. So the question I would ask is, is there a public interest in having uh, uh, an FAI, a mandatory FAI, that was one in all cases, into such deaths. I'm not suggesting for a moment that there shouldn't be an FAI into particular cases. For example, if there was some novel form of uh, exposure or some cluster of things that was causing concern. But would it be in the public interest to have it done as a matter of course when it means, as somebody said earlier, the use of public resources? So you would think it's a matter of public resources or more a matter of repetition of... Uh, indeed, indeed, it could arise because you could have a number of w w workers who some years back had suffered from exposure to something. Now, if you make it mandatory, then you have to have an FAI into the death of each of them. And what does each of these inquiries establish? That's what I ask myself. So you would have to have a mandatory for one particular type, a new type? Well, if there was something novel, yeah. I'm not suggesting for a moment it wouldn't be useful for the Royal Navigate in his discretion, or her discretion, yeah. to do that. But uh, that's a different matter. The STUC had indicated that um, the, the ambit of the mandatory FAI should be extended where it's new industries like fracking or nanotechnologies of... If deaths arise because of that, would, would you be sympathetic to that being mandatory, or do you think that could be no, covered I, by I, the discretion of the No, I think it's the Lord it, it, diff difficulty of terminology here, and I think the best course is to leave it uh, as uh, open at the discretion of the Lord Advocate. It's quite difficult to find formal words that will bring in what you want to bring in without bringing things you don't want to bring in. Jane, you've got something... Thank, Thank you, you, Convener. Uh, Lord Cullen, I'd like to return to the Convener's comments about the value of some sort of preliminary hearing and, and who might convene that. And I wonder if you'd like to comment on whether the timescales should be monitored because it's already been said it can take a long time for FAIs to, 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 to begin or to conclude. And do you think someone should monitor the delays and report back to interested parties about those delays? Well, I, let's not call it a preliminary hearing. That's because there's confusion. Let's call it an early hearing. Okay. And if it's an early hearing, I think uh, the answer to your question of monitoring is simply this. If it has taken place and it is inconclusive because things are still in progress, that's up to the sheriff to adjourn it to another date. Okay. And that's the way in which matters can be kept before the sheriff. And should that be communicated? Well, he will communicate it to the okay. parties, of course. He'll say, okay. I appreciate all that's been said today. I hope that's been useful for the families to okay. hear all this. Uh, it's plain that we have to wait for at least a month, so I'll adjourn this for another six weeks. Okay. That's Thank the way you. it would be done. 
Like it's a, a sort of light touch-ish way of making sure that there isn't unnecessary delay. Yes, mm-hmm. it's, a reass- it's a reassurance, if you like. Yes. Have any further questions? Have you anything further you wish to add, Lord Cullen? We haven't asked that we ought to have asked. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we don't mind being insulted. Um, I don't think there's any... Just one second. Um, no, I think you've covered all the things I thought you were going to ask about. And any of the things that I've not taken up in my, by, from my report have come up anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I suspend for a couple of minutes to allow witnesses to change over. Thank you very much. We're now into second panel of witnesses, and I note that you are in, in uh, you are certainly in uh, the um, committee room to hear the previous evidence, which I hope you found useful. I've got Julia Love, chairperson of the group Death Abroad. You're not alone, and members will be aware that Ms. Love has a petition PE 128 on fatal accidents abroad, which has been considered by the committee alongside this bill. Louise Taggart, founder member of Families Against Corporate Killers, and Flight Lieutenant James Jones, a retired member of the RAF, who's advised on several inquiries into fatal accidents excuse me involving military aircraft uh, and before we start can i just say that um when questions are addressed to you directly then your light will come on if not and um, you just indicate if you want to make a comment and i'll call you and your light will come on the microphone comes on automatically and it may be that you wish to make a very brief opening statement can i emphasize brief because we have your written submissions but certainly if you wish to make a brief opening statement uh, i'm happy i'm sure the committee would be happy to hear from you do you wish to do that no? All right. <laughs> uh, and I'll go straight to questions, please. Members, Margaret and Eileen. Um, I, I think most of you were in when Lord Khan gave evidence and then you would hear asked him about legal representation and his proposal to, um, to drop the test for reasonableness. I wonder, do you have any experience of relatives finding it difficult to, to get legal aid for legal representation? Ms Love. Um, well, I think that the difficulty when, when the death occurs abroad um, is, um, you know, they're applying for legal aid, but that the, it's not available because it's in another country. So most families that I, I know of have definitely not had, had legal aid. They've not had legal aid for, um, you know, travelling out with the country to attend um, court or whatever. They've had no assistance whatsoever. Okay. And more generally? Sorry, yeah, um, no, it was just, I don't have any specific examples, but I think after a work-related death, it's often the main breadwinner who has been the person who has been killed, and therefore there are significant financial issues um, for families left behind in those instances. So um, I think if legal aid were to be more readily available, that would certainly be a positive move. Okay, 
Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Uh, only to say that you know, my own experience has been dealing with the, the families and, uh, who were involved in the Nimrod accident in Afghanistan, where the bodies were repatriated to the coroner's cause in Oxford in England. And um, I think they were, there was no real problems with that. Yeah. Margaret. Could, could I ask um, perhaps uh, about the delays, if you have experience with the delays in holding um, f uh, fatal accident inquiries, and um, whether you think the proposal in the bill will help to speed up that or these delays, and, or do you have any suggestions yourself that aren't included in the bill? Yes, Mr. Taggart, yes. Okay. Um, I think from our perspective, uh, there... I know Lord Cullen said that it wasn't necessarily helpful to draw comparisons with what happens in England and Wales, but I think in this instance it maybe is, but to look at what they used to do, um, because it used to be the case in England and Wales that an inquest was held before the criminal prosecution took place. Now, that would be the case where it had been decided by the CPS that there wasn't to be a gross negligence manslaughter case or a corporate manslaughter case that it was simply to be that the Health and Safety Executive would take forward charges under the Health and Safety at Work Act. So if there was to be one of the manslaughter cases, the inquest would be held off with. The manslaughter case would go ahead in the Crown Court and then there might be an inquest. Whereas if it was just to be Health and Safety at Work Act offences, then the inquest would be held first. The HSE would often say that they saw that as part of their investigative process um, and that maybe things would come out of that inquest that they would find helpful um, for their prosecution. And then the prosecution would go ahead. So families were getting answers earlier um, because the inquest was going ahead beforehand and it wasn't seen that that was negatively impacting um, on the subsequent criminal prosecution. Uh, so... I think that that should be something that that is looked at, um, that we do consider having the FAI before uh, the criminal prosecution goes ahead. Perhaps, um, if not the full FAI, what Lord Cullen was suggesting was this initial hearing, an early hearing, it would just kind of give more information to the families. Do, I think, what you've just described without jeopardising anything else, which is the the kind of reason for delaying a lot of the, the early looking and informing relatives to be done in chambers with the families being informed of where we are now three months after the initial death, a, a maximum of three months after. Yeah, I think the early hearing probably wouldn't give families as much information as they're needing um, at that stage. I'm not sure how much progress would be able to be reported on um, at that stage. So if it were something that was then going to be a bit of a, if you like, kick up the backside for the Crown Office and Prosecution, Ser Crown Office and Prosecution Service to say, you know, this hasn't been progressed, it needs to be progressed, what are you doing <coughs> about it? Yeah, that, that's a positive step. But I think that in itself isn't enough for a family um, as somebody said earlier, that you know we can wait up to four years for an FAI to to kick off. We have instances of, as I said in the written evidence, of families having had to wait seven years before they find out that an FAI isn't then going to take place. Um, and these delays of seven, six years it is wholly unacceptable. So families need more answers more quickly. Um, and it needs to be more than just an update on progress as to where we're at. It needs to be answers as to how has my relative died, why has my relative died. I think it was purely for, you know, as you say, to focus the mind and to, to try and stop these it. long <laughs> d delays. It wouldn't be a, a preliminary inquiry establishing the facts, but it would very much be putting it on the radar and keeping track of it, as I, as I understand it. Mr. Jones? Yes, Mr. Jones. Yes, I don't want to keep talking about what happened south of the border, but... Going back to the Nimrod inquiry, certainly the families uh, had meetings with the, um, so that the, 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 the coroner, who, the potential coroner, uh, long before the inquest, and they, they talked issues through, which I think mm -hmm. they found very be beneficial. They got things off the chest. They knew that they could raise questions with him that they felt would be brought up at the inquest. 
and the talk of criminal proceedings actually came after or during the course of the inquest. You know, the talk of, of, of uh, corporate manslaughter was a, a, a verdict that he could have returned. Uh, so that went ahead before there was any talk about criminal proceedings. Thank you. There could be issues, however. I mean, um, if I say to Ms. Taggart, you said question as to how their loved one died or why they had died might very well, if you proceed with an FAI, and that's the kind of issues, quite rightly, that family members, relatives wish to know, would prejudice a trial. If that came up, because the party who might thereafter be accused has not been able to have the protection of presumption of innocence or even representation. I think that's the kernel of what Lord Cullen, heaven forfend, I interpret Lord Cullen, but the kernel of what he was saying is to prejudice a trial. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a grey area you, you would get it, into. It is a grey area, but I think there are some protections that are there, so a witness couldn't be compelled to answer a question that they thought might incriminate them. The determination of the sheriff couldn't be referred to in future criminal proceedings. So I think there are protections there um, built in. Does anybody else wish to comment? Do you think there's sufficient protection? I mean, I have grave concerns mm -hmm. myself, as you can hear from my question. Not that I haven't got sympathies for it, but I, I think the issue that my colleague raised about the early hearing and procedural is about as close as you can get without, in circumstances where there might be criminal proceedings in the air, without prejudicing a trial, and you wouldn't want that to happen either if somebody should be found <laughs> taken up the trial afterwards and the trial couldn't proceed because, you know, um, issues had been in the public domain in advance. Yeah, I mean, my, own, my only thing about that is the, as I say, the inquest procedure in England and Wales has been carrying this out um, for a number of years and it hasn't then prejudiced the criminal proceedings. I think there are certain instances where the coroner has stopped um, the inquest at a point where he's thought, hold on a minute, we need to refer this back to the CPS. And for in Scotland too as yeah, well. If, or, if it's um, not been foreseen, I think that can also happen in Scotland as well. Yeah, so again, that's, that's another sort of protection that's there that if the sheriff thought it had gone too far, they could stop the proceedings and uh, refer it back for further consideration. Mm. John? Well, oh, um, beg your pardon. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning, panel. It's, it's a question for Ms. Taggart, please. Um, I know you didn't wish to make an, an opening statement, Ms. Taggart, but um, uh, y your opening paragraph of your evidence talks about the background of your organisation, and it's a national campaign network which needs to stop uh, workers and others being killed in preventable incidents, and clearly there's a role for the health and safety executive in that. Further on in your evidence, you talk about uh, you say, often where a mandatory FAI does not take place is because it's said that the full facts and circumstances have been explored in criminal proceedings. But you express a frustration about that. I wonder if you could share that with the committee, please. Yeah, I think it's, it's fairly rare for a case to go to a full trial um, where it's a work-related death. So my brother was killed at work which is why I'm involved with FAC. He um, was killed in 2005, and a criminal um, prosecution did go ahead in 2008. And it was a full trial, three and a half weeks long. But that tends not to happen. It tends to be that four or five years down the line, the Crown Office Pro Procurator Fiscal Service has um, come to a plea arrangement with the employer. And... So that's, that's what happens in court. You go into court, you hear the plea arrangement that's been made. You don't then get to hear from witnesses. You don't get to see all the documentation. You don't get to see uh, the photographic evidence or whatever else there may be. So in that sense, it's kind of a bit of a it's burst your bubble. Um, that you've waited this long. You think this is going to go ahead. You think you're going to find out all the facts and circumstances. And then you don't. But then they come to you and say, we're not going to hold an FAI because we think all the facts and circumstances have come out. Well, how can they possibly have come out if, if you've not heard from anybody? Um, and, of course, the purpose of the full for, um, facts and circumstances coming out is that others can learn. So, for instance, the Health and Safety could initiate further proceedings. Yeah, and in my brother's case, right. we, we got to the end of the three-and-a-half-week trial, were asked... Do you want an FAI? 
and given all my campaigning background, you would have thought I would have said, yes, of course we do. But by the end of the three and a half week trial, we're so exhausted that we couldn't have. Mm -hmm. We'll suspend. We'll suspend for a couple. Back in business, uh, John. Okay, a, a follow-on for that for, for the panel generally, if, if maybe Mr. Taggart wants to pick it up too, and that is uh, suggestions about making sheriff's findings um, more effective, the recommendations. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll pick that up. Um, I mean, I think it's fairly sympathetic to having more power behind recommendations so that uh, organisations or businesses and companies can't just walk away from it. Mm -hmm. But so we'd be happy to hear whether you feel there should be more power to it. Anybody on the panel that wants to, to feel that. Ms Taggart, do you want to, Miss Love, do you want to have come in well, here? I'll just speak briefly just about my own case for when, when my son died um, and the recommendations so that there was no fatal accident inquiry, there was no inquiry whatsoever. But for me, and I suppose what kind of pushed me to, to put the petition through to the Parliament as well was that there was no one speaking on my behalf or, or any other families um, mm -hmm. when, when a death occurs abroad. And it was simple things like, I mean, I wrote to President Xavi, who was the president of um, Venezuela at the time, um, do you know, and I, I was just a mum, you know, a wee Glasgow mum that, um, whereas I, I felt that if there had been a recommendation from, you know, my elected MSP or, or the, oh, the government or the UK government, um, you know, that there might have been, um, and what I was asking for, you know, why was there not lifeguards on that particular beach? Why was there, um, why was there no warning signs and things like that, which I feel, you know, for, for anybody, because Colin researched his holiday, you know, thoroughly everywhere he was going, he was, you know, this is great, this is where I'm going to be going, I'll be doing this here, etc. So, you know, for anybody in the future going to that same area, the same thing could happen, and it did happen again and again, and it's still happening today. So, so for me... Um, I think the most important thing is recommendations. When when someone dies abroad, that our government can recommend. I know you know it's not always that they will carry out these recommendations, but at least that process would be in place. The, the, the bill as published then is, is helpful. At section six, the the new one about inquiries into deaths occurring abroad. You know, which does say an inquiry is to be held in the death of which says, if the Lord Advocate considers death as sudden, suspicious, or unexplained, or current circumstances giving rise to serious public concern. So, sudden, suspicious, or unexplained. Do you think this is helpful? I think it will be, yeah, but I think there has to be a broader discussion, um, you know, around it. But, yeah, I think it definitely will make a difference. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Any other comments? I yes. The, what about the... So, the, the repatriating of. of uh, military personnel who have died overseas. You know, I, I think what's important is, I, I think it's commendable that we can say that we could have a, an FAI here in Scotland rather than have a coroner's inquest in, in England, because having spent three weeks with the families in the, on the Nimrod inquest, I know how, how sort of uh, grueling and demanding mm. going south of the border for three weeks is. But I would say, and I hope we'll get a chance to explain later on, that what's also important is that we know how we deal with the deaths of service people in Scotland not just repatriating people who have died abroad. 
because you have, if you bring them back, you've got to bring them back to a system that is compatible for all. Mm -hmm. Well, you, I don't know if you're ready to develop that particular line, John. Yeah, it was about how robust sheriff recommendations yes, uh, okay. can, well, can be, and if, if the panel had any suggestions to, to enhance the, the standing of them. No, I... I just said, we'll yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Question um, for you, yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Ms. Taggart. Um, I, I think part of the reason why we decided not to go ahead with the FAI at the end of the trial was that, you know, what was going to come out of it, uh, what, what use could come out of it at the end, and if a recommendation could be made but nothing could be done about it, if it wasn't followed, then you know, what valuable outcome really um, was there likely to be, given what we would then need to put ourselves through again. Yeah. So I think if recommendations can be binding, families would be more likely, and if the FAI was to take place earlier, families would be more likely to go ahead with it. Um, they do want lessons to be learned absolutely from the deaths of their loved ones. Um, the example that I give at the end of my paper is about Barry Martin um, and Michael Adamson was my brother so we had to listen to evidence at the trial that seven electricians had died across the UK between 2004 and 2006 because of the exact same failure which a failure to ensure that safe isolation equipment was being provided um, to electricians so if, a, if an FAI is held early and recommendations are made out of that, you potentially save six of those lives. Mm -hmm. you, you made also a point about when there's a guilty... Let's say there's a criminal trial first, but there's a guilty plea and you don't hear anything. There's plea bargaining. What, what is your thing there that we should then have an FEI, whether it's restricted or whatever, an FEI of some kind to establish the facts and circumstances when you've not been privy to any of the um, uh, evidence, if it's yeah. pre-trial? Facts and circumstances, and go on to to hear about lessons learned as well, yeah, to yeah. Um, determine lessons learned. An and point. I think there's there's even more of an impetus to make recommendations binding if there's to be a move to take um, FAIs out of sheriff courts, because that maybe, albeit it's a good move for families who feel a bit more relaxed, it maybe takes away some of the gravitas from what the sheriff then puts out at the end. Um, I've always so found Sheriff scary. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've appeared in front of them uh, in a professional capacity. They've got gravitas, yeah. usually. But I, I just mean from the perspective of, particularly if somebody's not been a party to the inquiry or whatever, they yeah. get uh, something out that maybe they think, well, do I really have to do anything about this? And I think I would go further than term them recommendations as well. Uh, there's been a move in England for these coroner's reports to be termed reports to prevent future deaths. I think something mm -hmm. more like that would um, be a helpful move. It, again, it gives it more impact um, rather than I mean, a recommendation to have to follow that or do I not. Um, I've got... I think that's... Is that you? Yes, thank you. I've got... I'll get my glasses on, Elaine. <laughs> thank you, Convener. Can I... I uh, return to the issue of military deaths because I have to say I was surprised, not to say the least, to read in the evidence that uh, Mr Jones had given to us that uh, members of the interpretation of the current act by the Crown Office discriminates against members of the armed forces in that they are not regarded as employees. Mm. I wonder if you could expand on on the issue around that. Uh, how it affects military yes, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm not sure I'm the person to expand on it. It's the mm. Crown Office that needs to expand on it. Yeah. But it does appear... What was the effect on that in terms of, of military personnel? Or well, OK, well? as far as the Crown Office is concerned, the, the current Act talked about employees and employers. And for some reason, uh, that has been, is now being viewed as because service people do not have an official signed contract, mm. they are Crown uh, appointees that they're not considered to be um, employed. And that's come as a big surprise for myself and a lot of, of my colleagues who have been obviously unemployed for many years. Um, mm. But that's their interpretation, that they're not, they're not employees. And therefore, um, when we have what I would term as a work-related death and a mm. call for a mandated uh, FAI, they have not been mm. fitted into that category. 
Now, I, I think that's wrong. It, it seems to be uh, that interpretation seems to go against what I can call the what I believe is the intent of the act. Mm -hmm. um, when someone wrote the the, the act. I'm sure they didn't sit down and say, let's put in the words employee and employer so we can exclude military personnel. It, it was just a way of saying mm. it's work-related. And I think that's what Lord Cullen has said. We carry this mandated um, FAAs forward for, for work-related deaths. Mm. Uh, for me, the, the three people, and I've only used this as an example. Mm. There are other examples. The three uh, uh, people, crew members, who died in the tornado collision that was a work-related death. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I, I don't see, I can't get my head around any other explanation. And I realized then that, that the Lord Advocate has the power to say, right, it's, it, I, can, I can, um, can I say, not go ahead with a work-related death as long as there's, a, a, there's been like a, a public inquiry, uh, a criminal uh, investigation. But that hasn't taken place either. What has happened is, the, the Military Aviation Authority, which is part of the military of, Ministry of Defence. Mm -hmm. uh, it it says it's independent, but it's, it is part of the Ministry of Defence. They have carried out um, an investigation. Uh, they produced a report. Um, in carrying out that investigation, there was no, there was no independent judge present, present. There was no cross-examination. It was, by their own definition, an in-house Examine, internal investigation. Families weren't involved. No one was allowed to put forward any questions. Now, that is what's been presented to the, to the Procurator Frisk on the Crown Office. And they said, oh, this will do uh, instead of an FEI. Now, I don't think it will do. And if I could just bear with you a, a little longer, it's not... I cited that in my report as an example. If I go back to... Um, the accident on the mill of Kintyre, which is about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I read through here the, the, uh, the, re the review carried out by um, Lord Philip in 2011. He says here that the inquiry is an internal process. The Board of Inquiry was not a substitute for a legal inquiry into the case of the circumstances of death. So it was in there. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say, and this is very interesting, the Lord Advocate concluded that the fatal accident inquiry was necessary because some of those on board at the time of the, the crash were engaged in the course of their employment. Mm. And that comes up in the, in the email I got from the Procurator. Mm. In the course, while not mandatory in respect of all the deaths, the inquiry would relate to all on board. So even 20 years ago, this line between civilian deaths mm. and service deaths was being drawn. And the Mullikintai FAI only took place because there were civilians on board. Can I ask you, did you make these rec recommendations to the, to the government at the time of the consultation? Do you feel your concerns sorry, are taken I, up properly? I, 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 the consultation document you talked mm. about, was it this last year? Mm -hmm. yeah, no, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. And I, must, I was involved in this case. I must say that I wasn't aware of... No one pointed out there was a consultation mm. document... Uh, coming forward and it, it is just fortuitous that a few weeks ago when we were all can I say bitterly disappointed about the Crown Office's decision not to hold an FAI, mm -hmm. FAI for this uh, tornado crash that I, I thumbed through the website and found hey there's a bill in process maybe this is a chance now to, to, mm. to come forward and unless you recognize what's gone wrong in the past if you carry that forward it would be wrong in the future as well. Yeah, I, I presume that in terms of Lord Cullen, so it's a pity we didn't really get the opportunity to ask Lord Cullen about this, but presumably it wasn't actually within the remit of his uh, report either, if, I, if I, you weren't I, coming I don't What's think, bewildering yeah. me is I'm looking at section 2.3 uh, of the bill, which in the explanatory notes and the policy says this replicates a section of the 1976 Act, and that says it's mandatory while the person was acting the course of their employment or occupation. It isn't just it employment, it's or occupation. So even if there's an argument, which I don't necessarily agree with, that you're not employed uh, because of the system under which you're in the armed forces, it was your occupation. So I don't know how it's... I, I mean, I thought, I thought this was new. 
and therefore cured the issue, but it seems to have been under the 1976 Act anyway. So I'm not quite sure why the Crown Office considered that if you're in the armed forces, you weren't doing something, in this case, on your occupation. Well, I just put that in the air because I don't understand. I think this is the first time that this has been, has been challenged, but I think by referring to the statement about the Mull of Kintyre, some time then, yeah. someone decided, let us, let us play around with these words, employee and employer, and take service people out, and that is wrong. But I'm keeping away from employee and employer, it I, says I know, well, or or occupation. Okay, so I, even if you fail on the yes, employment, which I don't I, think you necessarily do, no. occupation would seem to me to cover it. And it's not even new, it's under the 1976 Act. Correct. So Absol absolutely. It's my perhaps mind. it's yeah. covered anyway, we can ask well, the Crown Office. When it, it has been, uh, well, I'm, uh, yes, when I say that the Crown Office's interpretation is not in line with the intent of the of the Act. I mean, after the Mullah Kintyre accident, what is even crazier is a, a tornado took off from RAF Marham in England, flew over the border, and crashed in Glen Ogle, Scotland. There was no fatal accident inquiry because these guys were not occupied or not on not employed, and because they were didn't. They'd left England, England, English airspace. There was no coroner's inquest. Now, they were in the course of their occupation. Yes, I know, I know, madam. But, but, but that, that is, that is something that you, this is the question that I'm asking mm -hmm. the Crown Office. Why yeah. are we coming up with these? Right. Because it's not, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to Angus Robertson. It doesn't make sense to the family's lawyer or the families. Roddy, you want to come in on that no, point Just to me? say that obviously it's a, it is, we obviously need probably to look back at, for what it's worth, what, what the background was to the passage of the 1976 Act. But all I would say is that it's not really a question, it's more of a comment that the, the, the royal prerogative and the comment system uh, memorial encyclopedia are not new. So uh, I just put that in You better tell us what these are because... Well, they, the, uh, they, you've actually referred to that in your, uh, in your written submission. Yes, that is what, that's the answer, I, what I've got there is, is the answer back from the, from the, Crown, from yeah. the Crown Office, for the Procurator of Fiscal, that, um, but I, I also said that um, in 2012, I think uh, Lord uh, Newberger, when he was dealing with the Snatch Land Rover uh, accident, he made it clear that these people who died were employees, and the MOD is their employer. So, for me, that makes it even clearer. Yeah, but you've got two arguments there, employee yeah. or occupation. Occupate. You've got That's two it. lines so of uh, argument. Uh, Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I may add something. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Sure. Uh, it's regarding as, uh, what you just said earlier about the MOD investigating itself. Uh, are you recommending that it should be a civil uh, in inquiry? What I'm saying is that that it's okay for the for the the MOD, or should I say the, the, the Military Aviation Authority, to do their own inquiry. Uh, it's important they do that, because if there are any immediate problems, they can put them right. But what I'm saying mean is that this inquiry does not replace a, f a, a, a proper, um, um, can I say, inquiry in the, in, the, in the public domain. There is no one, there's no input to that inquiry. It is, it's like asking... Um, a, a, a person who runs a factory and, that, and someone dies because of the way a machine is operated unsafely and you ask the, the owner of the, of the factory please carry out your own investigation and make some recommendations and then take his report and say thank you very much, that, that's fine no you wouldn't do that you'd say we need, we need um, as, as Lord Collins said FAIs are carried out in the public interest the public interest has not been satisfied in this case. As a representative of the North East, I'm quite you know, uh, used to, to public inquiries regarding uh, an accident, but could you maybe elaborate a little bit on what is the difference between what the MOD has done and what's happening, for example, when we've got an accident in the North Sea with the Super Puma? Is there a huge difference between the two kind of inquiries? 
Uh, well, in, if I take the Super Puma inquiry, the, the inquiry, the investigation there is carried out by the Air Accident Infra Investigation Branch, and they um, carried out an, a detailed investigation. It took, as I said in my report, 30 months. Then it was decided, okay, this needs to be discussed now in the public interest. So we'll have an FAI. A FAI. With the Ministry of Defence, we have this now, the Military Aviation Authority. They carry out an investigation, uh, and there are some very strict guidelines for, for that, in terms of reference. And, and, the, and the procurator official can take that report and say, yes, okay, that is a piece of evidence. Let us now have a fatal accident inquiry. I mean, you'll see in my report, even the president of, this, the, of the service inquiry, who I've been in touch with, said, look, there were, there were certain courses of, of uh, lines of in, interrogation that I wanted to go down, but I was prevented. And also, I don't think my re report is complete. Since the FBI was rejected, he's written to me and said, I, it, it makes a nonsense of one of my recommendations, was, which was, we really didn't have enough skills to go the full way. That I expected a, another inquiry to take place. A last question, if I may. Uh, uh, it's not only to Mr. Jules, but as well to, to Ms. Love. Regarding the recovery of, uh, of the bodies, you know, have you got some question to say, you know, air, air accident, you, you could have a problem when, when you can't recover uh, uh, bodies when, when, when a, a fatality happens abroad. So uh, have you got any views on this? M me personally? Yeah. Um, I think it's from Ms. Love. And Ms. Love, that's okay, yeah. yeah. Well, I know, I, w I was around when we we brought the bodies back from Afghanistan. And of course, they went into, came back by Bryce Norton, and they went into a coroner's in inquest there. And what I'd say right now, until we know how service people are dealt with, or what the interpretation is with regards to service people when they come yes, to Scotland, yes. I, would say, I would say this. If someone has died abroad, I would bring them back through Bryce Norton. Because in Bryce Norton, coming that way, you are guaranteed an inquest. Here in Scotland, you aren't guaranteed an FAI. Yeah, and well, my question was, if, if you can't recover the body, you know, you, you, you can't have one in England or in Scotland. If you can't recover the body... Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the air... I, I, would, I would say, well, in the Nimrod case, it was very difficult to recover the bodies, but it was, it was a token recovery, let's put it that way. I think there could, should be a point where um, the families should have an input to this, you know. Do you want this body, do you want it repatriated to England or Scotland? And right now, I would, I, would, I would go for England. I'd like to go for Scotland. I've lived here so long. I'd like to go for Scotland, but I know that my interests are best served if I came back and had people repatriated to, through England. Miss Love. I think um, the, the question, um, you know, if the bodies aren't recovered, I mean, there, there's been very few incidents that I know of anyway for Scots where I think there was um, when the, the Thailand, um, when there was the tsunami um, yes. and there was a Scot there who I think is still not been um, registered as a death, it's still a missing person. So there, there's been very few incidents where, you know, the body hasn't been recovered um, mainly, we've only had to deal with when the body has been repatriated back to Scotland and that there's been no inquiry whatsoever, no investigation. So I wanted to be reassured, you, in, you know, the members of your organisation, there is no, there is no uh, concern about this? There's no major concern about that. I mean, there are missing um, persons organisations throughout the world that, that we deal with as well, but... Um, but just now, um, there's been nothing, um, there's been no major where the body hasn't been recovered. Thank you. But I think, are, are you content with the section where it says, uh, where it's discretionary when it's a death abroad, consider the death was sudden, suspicious or unexplained, or occurred in circumstances giving rise to serious public concern? Obviously, with tsunami, we know what happened yeah. there. So you wouldn't want it mandatory in all circumstances, surely. I no, mean, definitely not. No. I mean, I mean, there will be investigations carried out yeah. in you know other countries, and we don't want to mimic them in this country. Um, but there, there is, there's most definitely circumstances where the family feel that the, the investigation hasn't been thorough enough. Um, you know that the. Um, 
Do you think, therefore, there should be uh, the Lord Advocate? And an explanation was given to yourself, Mr Jones, why there was no FEI. But do you think that in circumstances where there isn't an FEI, there should always be a written, at least a written explanation by the Lord Advocate, in, in a fairly full written explanation of why there hasn't been an FEI? I think so. And I think even that, you know, this talk about the, prelimin the preliminary um, hearing or inquiry. An early, an yeah, early, an early hearing. An you hearing, get our words yeah. up. Yes. Um, would be beneficial for families as well, because they yeah. could then express their thoughts at that stage. I think well. my colleague asked the question about re recovery of body, because there may be circumstances, particularly, Christian, you may want to pick it up from your experience of the North Sea. Yes, it's, it's, it's what I wanted to speak about, Mr. Jones. Is is uh, 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 accident will uh, will make it practically impossible in some circumstances to, to recover the bodies. Mm -hmm. So you will have a, a, a barrier to to have a, a, an, 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 an inquiry because of it. Yes, I think the 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 inquiry that really was carried out by the by the Air Accident Investigation Branch into the Super Puma really focused on what went wrong with the. With the helicopter, yeah. basically, and, and 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 again, that was a, a piece of useful useful evidence that the the sheriff could could uh, could could consult or refer to during his in inquiry. Can I just just say that? Yeah, just sorry, I, just, yes. I think the concern of my colleague the colleagues in the panel is in section six one c. One of the criteria is that the person's body has been brought to Scotland. And we were concerned, notwithstanding what Ms Love has to say about bodies are generally covered, that there may be a circumstance where that just is not possible. And yet, an FAI really might be the appropriate way forward. And, and I think we were, might be looking fairly sympathetically, perhaps, I'm looking round, that that and might not amendment. necessarily have to be the case. Yeah that a body is returned, but there may be sufficient evidence, notwithstanding that, to, to go for an FAI. Would you have concerns I, that it, a body must be returned to Scotland? I would, I would say that I think if it's, if it's clear that, you know, basically what has happened, someone has, has fallen overboard, for example, yes. um, then it, 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 it fallen overboard. There's no question about it that, that you can't find the body, yeah. so that I shouldn't, should, that shouldn't rule out an FAI. Okay, that's what I Sometimes we have aircraft accidents where you know there is really nothing left, to put it bluntly. Yes, mm -hmm. you know that shouldn't stop an, an FAI yeah, taking place. I mean that's place. our point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's our point. Yeah. Can I also raise as well because in certain, uh, some instances, more so in the past, but the Foreign Office um, have recommended to UK and Scottish citizens that the um, body is cremated in the country where the person right. has died for financial reasons, etc. So we've come across some families where, um, you know, they've had a cremation and then, what, you know, they found out other things yes. that, that, you know, that, that's possibly been suspicious and obviously they don't have a body so they can't have um, mm. a post-mortem to yeah. investigate it further. So that perhaps is... Not necessarily, not necessarily in the bill that it's mandatory, which it is at the moment. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh -huh. MDLs. Yes. Well. Can I maybe to, to Miss Love a question about we had just a submission from Police Scotland. Uh, do you think as the implementation of that bill we could have uh, a, a, a Police Scotland will not have the resources or the expertise to respond to uh, the need of the families of investigating abroad? Yeah, well, um, I read the response um, and I've not really had much time to, to speak to our trustees as well, but on going on my own kind of personal opinion, I believe um, within Scotland the resources are there for Police Scotland to support families just now. I mean, we don't have a process in Scotland that, that Police Scotland deliver the death message <coughs> when, when someone dies abroad. And that system is already in place. We don't have a system where the, um, you know, the family are allocated a, a police liaison officer. Thanks very much. A family liaison officer. We don't have a process for that in Scotland. Um, so these systems are already in place. So that wouldn't, you know, that there wouldn't be a financial impact there. I suppose it would be if there had to be an investigation in another country. Um, but, I mean, just now, we don't have the statistics either, um, or we've got very scarce statistics of how many Scots have died abroad and are repatriated back to the UK. So what we would need to consider is how many deaths, how many investigations are we looking at? And I would say um, maximum three a year, but, you know, just now, um, 
take within the past three years, we would maybe one every year, going by the, the statistics that we've gathered. So, OK. Thank you. That's it. Well, that's it. I've no, oh, sorry, Mr Jones. Raise a point. Um, earlier on, you talked about the, the Lord Advocate giving the answers to why he didn't, we didn't hold a, an FAI for the... We can't go into a specific case. No, OK. We can deal okay. with the generality. Oh, OK, yes. OK. Really, the, the reason... Because the, someone referred to... I, he gave me an answer here. He, he didn't. The answer given was that the... The final answer was given was the report prepared by, by the MOD had got, was, was sufficient. Right. And I'm saying that that doesn't yes. meet the criteria laid out in the bill for yeah. a report. We can talk about the generality of whether it is yes. internal yes. reports. Yes, yes I'm, I'm saying that that report yes. did not satisfy the criteria. And therefore, in my opinion, humble opinion, the Lord Advocate was wrong or his mm. department was wrong just to say that. Ms. Taggart. Can I just make a couple of of course, things of as course. well? Is that okay? Um, in terms of the written reasons, I think as the bill is currently drafted, a family has to request those written reasons. That should be an automatic, that a family gets written reasons as to why an FAI... I think it's a requirement in the bill, but I'll just check. Um, what section is this? I, I think it's a requirement to give them, but only if the family asks for them. Which section is that? A family shouldn't have to ask. No, no, for those I appreciate that. I'm just checking uh, where it is in the bill. Has anybody found it? Section? Um, Section 8. All right, thank you. Let's see what it says. Must, if required, to do so. You're quite right. Yeah, so uh, yes. it, it should be a given that those those reasons are given to a family um, and Julie's saying that it shouldn't that they shouldn't just turn up out of the blue either and um, there sh should be some sort of pre-warning to families that they're on their way uh, but a family should should get a full explanation as to yeah. why an FAI isn't going ahead if but we should keep it to that uh, keep it to the group of people this uh, group of yeah. people categories that are yes yeah, I think that's can, sensible yeah. yes um, must give reasons to and then A, B, C is what you're saying in yeah. that section, I yeah. understand. Um, yeah. And then just one more uh, point to make about, there was discussion earlier about in mental health cases, whether those mm -hmm. yes. um, should be mandatory. I have personal experience of a school friend whose sister um, committed suicide in a mental health hospital. The circumstances of her death Two months later, I read about two other deaths in a Glasgow mental health hospital, um, very similar circumstances, um, all suicides. So I think uh, those should be mandatory. They're some of the most vulnerable people in our society. They're under the care of a hospital. Um, in those circumstances, particularly where there's a suicide, th th absolutely there should be a mandatory FAI um, in those circumstances. Well, we'll certainly put these to the Crown and to the Cabinet Secretary when he comes. Can I thank you very much for your evidence? It's hard to do, but you did it very well. Thank you very much. I suspend for two minutes.
question. Thank you. Uh, item 3, next item, consider six negative instruments, all relating to pension schemes. The first is the Firefighters Pension Scheme Amendment, Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015, oblique 140. It amends the Fireman's Pension Scheme Order of 1992, consequential to the introduction of same-sex marriage, and also sets out the revised 1992 scheme pensionable pay bans. The DPLR drew the attention of the Parliament to this instrument as it breaches the 28-day rule. Do members have any comments in relation to this instrument? Are members content to make no recommendation? Mm -hmm. The second negative instrument we're considering is the Firefighters Pension Scheme Amendment, Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, oblique 141. This provides transitional arrangements for members who transfer to the Firefighters Pension Scheme Scotland 2015. It sets out more detail on scheme governance and membership contributions from 1st April 2015. The DPLR committee agreed to draw the attention of part of this instrument on, as several regulations are, wait for it, quotes defectively drafted, where we heard that before. Do members have any comments in relation to this instrument? Not really in, in relation to the instrument, but I think it's a bit concerning that so many of these instruments Indeed. are defectively drafting that they... Uh, I think the DPLR is making, making uh, quite a bit of noise about this, as quite rightly uh, it seems um, this is not appropriate for a professional mm. parliament to have so much in the way of defective drafting. Mm. Are members content, however, to make no recommendation in relation to this parliament, this instrument, this parliament? <laughs> Don't take me up on that one. The third negative instrument we're considering here today is the Police Pension Scheme Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015-142. This provides for a reform pension scheme for Police Scotland. The DPLR committee agreed to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument as the drafting appears to be defective mm. in a number of areas. Do members have any comments on SSI 2015-142? Same, same, same story. Mm. Are members content to make no recommendation in relation yes. to this instrument? The fourth negative instrument is in the Firefighters' Com Compensation Scheme and Pension Scheme Amendment Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015-143. This updates provisions as a consequence of the coming into force of the Firefighters Pension Scheme 2015 to ensure that compensation awards are made in the event of a qualifying injury or death in service in accordance with the compensation scheme. The DPLR committee agreed to draw the attention of the Parliament to this instrument as it breaches the 28-day rule and is, do you want to join in with me, <laughs> defectively drafted. <laughs> and I don't say that flippantly. Do any members have comments in relation to this SSI? I take it silence says, you know, are you content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? I really do think, however, if I see the words defectively drafted again, that we may want to add, and it's going to come up again, we may want ourselves to write in relation to this because it's all very well, but familiarity does not breed, it does in fact breed some contempt here, I was going to say, of the kind that's not wanted. Um, you would agree? Okay. The fifth negative instrument considering is the Fireman's Pension Scheme Amendment Number 2. Why is it called the Fireman's and not the Firefighters? I'm a bit taken aback by that, but there we are. Fireman's Pension Scheme Amendment Number 2, Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015-173. This clarifies commutation factors for firefighters retiring, I see, from the Fireman's Pension Scheme. It's relating to the previous Order 1992. The DPLR Committee agreed not to draw this this instrument, the attention of the Parliament. Do members have any comments? Yep. Are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? Yep. The final negative instrument we are considering today is the Police Pensions Amendment Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, I 174. This uh, co clarifies commutation factors for police officers retiring under Police Pension Regulations 1987. The DPLR Committee agreed not to draw this instrument to the attention of the Parliament. Do members have any comments in relation to this instrument? No. Are members content to make no recommendation in relation to this instrument? No. Item 4, subordinate legislation. It's considered one more instrument which is not subject to any parliamentary procedure. Act of a General Criminal Procedure Rules Amendment Number 2, European Protection Orders 2015, SSI 2015 121. This inserts a new Chapter 61 into Criminal Procedure Rules 1996 to make provision in consequence of an EU Directive on the European Protection Order. We previously agreed to consider... Any no procedure instrument? Ah, yes, sorry, just sounded a bit odd. Hmm. Where the DPLR committee raises concerns. The DPLR committee has agreed to draw this instrument to the attention of it appears to be defectively drafted. 
Are members content to endorse the DPLR committee's comments? Yes. I think more than endorse, we've already we said we want to write separately with the number of instruments that come before this committee, which appear in increasing numbers to be defectively drafted. Yep. Yep. Okay, okay. Yep. And we now move into private session.